So uh, first of all, questions about the, uh, the, the synoptic problem and the dating of the gospel. The, synoptic, the problem of the synoptic that's in the synoptic problem is the question of the relationship among the different synoptic gospels. The synoptic gospels are the first three gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, which differ in a lot of respects from the Gospel of John. Uh, but this, the three synoptic gospels kind of hang together. They have a similar uh, structure to them. They, have, uh, they uh, focus on the ministry in Galilee, uh, which is uh, not something that John focuses on. And there's a lot of common themes, uh, the parables that are retold in uh, each of the Gospels. There are miracles that are retold in each of the Gospels that are not found in John. Um, so the, the synoptic problem focuses on those first three Gospels. And the question is the relation among them uh, uh, in terms of literary dependence. Uh, how, did the th how did we end up with these three Gospels that are so similar and yet diverge in significant ways? Uh, what's going on, not in terms of what, uh, the, the synoptic problem is not about the intentions of the authors. Um, it's not about the, th the, the way that the authors have organized material to uh, uh, highlight, uh, promote certain themes. The synoptic problem is about the sources. How did we come up with these three Gospels? And the consensus today, the consensus for the last century or so, is that Mark is the first of the Gospels and that um, Matthew and Luke draw on Mark. And so when you have something that's common to all three Gospels, then uh, you have uh, Mark is the source and then Matthew and Luke used Mark, uh, modified him in certain respects, but, um, had, uh, um, but were dependent on Mark. But there's also common material in uh, Matthew and Luke that's not found in Mark. And so the question becomes, where did that come from? How did we end up with material that seems so similar in Matthew and Luke um, that uh, is not found in the, uh, the source uh, that is the Gospel of Mark? And the answer to that, uh, the consensus answer today, is that there was a second main source known as source. Um, Q, or Kivela, which means source. And the Q document is made up of those sections of Matthew and Luke that are common to the two Gospels but are not found in Mark. So I've got a, I've got a little formula. Matthew plus Luke minus Mark equals Q. Okay. So the, the, uh, the idea is that uh, Matthew might have his own sources, but he's also drawing on Mark and he's drawing on this other document. Uh, Luke has his own sources. There are things that are in Luke that are not found in either of the other two synoptics or in John. Um, so there's, um, Luke has his own sources, but he also has Mark, and then he's also drawing on Q. So um, that's, how, that's, the, that's the paradigm that's used. And of course, uh, there's no document named, uh, there's no document that's been found that uh, matches Q. Um, it's a constructed document based on the the uh, Matthew and Luke and what's common between them. Um, that doesn't keep commentators from writing extensive commentaries on Q. <laughs> <laughs> the non source. Yes, the non-existent source that no one has ever found and no one will find. The argument is that the, the Matthew and Luke are too similar uh, in their wording and in their structure and so on when they're departing from Mark and when they have things in common. They're too similar to be uh, based on common oral sources. They, it must be a written source, the argument is, and they must be drawing from a written source. So there's a Q document in the background. Um, I think that's, uh, that, uh, uh, that's an entirely unnecessary uh, 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 hypothesis. You don't need another, uh, you don't need another document uh, to explain the similarities and differences. You can explain it in terms of dependence of one gospel writer on others. Um, and part, of the, part of the issue for, uh, this is involved with the dating issue too, part of the issue for New Testament scholarship has been you have to fill in the gap between Jesus, dies roughly in 30 AD, and when the gospels appear, which according to the contemporary consensus is much later in the first century, sometime in the last decades of the first century. So how do you bridge that gap it's, you can't bridge that, the, the, uh, the hypothesis is you can't bridge that gap with oral tradition because the oral tradition would get fragmented and would change and you wouldn't have the consistency that you have among the three uh, synoptics. 
Uh, so there must be a written source that has a fixed account of certain things that bridges that gap. And the, again, Mark and Q make up the two main written sources and then uh, each has their own, uh, their own other sources. And part of the problem, uh, part of the issue has to do with um, um, the dating. So that, that comes into play when you're talking about the synoptic problem, you're not just talking about the, not just about the relation among the different Gospels, but about the, um, about the date of the Gospels and where they fit relative to the events that they describe. Um, is, uh, so if you have, um, on the other hand, as tr the traditional view has, the Gospel writers are um, either apostles or related to apostles. Matthew is an apostle according to the patristic tradition. Mark is dependent on Peter. Uh, Luke is not an apostle, but he is, uh, has some connections with the apostles, and so he's got uh, sources and eyewitnesses, and he, uh, has, he records things that, hard to imagine, can't come from anything but eyewitnesses. So if you posit that, then uh, you can explain the uh, continuity and the continuities and discontinuities, the similarities and differences between them. The gospel writers know about each other, and they are using uh, their, the previous gospels so uh, David Wenham redating uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and he suggests a um, uh, suggests a, a different paradigm that dates everything much earlier than uh, the consensus view would have. Uh, and part of his argument has to do with this. He, he does address the synoptic problem, uh, and he doesn't think that uh, Mark and priority is uh, is um, Con there's conclusive arguments in favor of Mark and priority. He points out that most of the arguments for literary dependence are easily reversible. So, you know, Mark says Mark has an account of a parable. Matthew has an account of a parable. Mark's is a little bit longer than Matthew's. You could say, well, Matthew is dependent on Mark, but edited and shortened it. Or you could say that uh, Mark is dependent on Matthew, but added stuff to it. I mean, how can you... How can you determine dependence one way or the other? And he says most of the arguments for Mark and priority are reversible. And he argues actually for Matthean priority and for uh, the conclusion, which is the patristic conclusion, my view is also that uh, the uh, canonical order of the Gospels is the order of composition. So Matthew was first. Mark wrote knowing Matthew's Gospel. Uh, Luke wrote knowing both. John uh, wrote knowing the previous Gospels. But when I'm in addition to talking about the synoptic problem, talks about the dating, uh, and he begins, uh, he works backwards from Luke, uh, uh, sorry, from Acts. So the question he poses at the beginning is, why does Acts end where it does? You have this trajectory in the latter part of Acts with Paul going to toward Rome. He ends up in Rome, of course, in the book of Acts, but he doesn't put on trial. We don't have any, any account of uh, Paul's trial um, before Caesar, you have that's the that's the where everything is going, and uh, it seems inconclusive. It's not, I don't think, but that's the it, it can seem historically inconclusive when you have that trajectory toward a trial before Caesar. And Wenham's argument is that the the book ends there because that was the state of things when Luke finished the book of Acts, which uh, may be the case. It may be that he ended there for other thematic reasons. But Wenham argues that uh, that uh, uh, Paul was in Rome, but not yet had not yet been tried by Caesar, and not had not yet had any uh, whatever whatever the outcome of that was uh, martyrdom or whatever. Um, uh, that hadn't happened yet, so that places uh, the end of Acts in the early 60s. Uh, Luke, the Gospel of Luke, is written prior to uh, Acts. Um, uh, Wenham argues that, uh, that Luke wrote his first, and, and Luke says that in his address to Theophilus at the beginning of, not Theopolis, but Theophilus, at the beginning of Acts. Uh, he says that this is the second account, this is a continuation of the account. I wrote before the beginning of what Jesus began to do and teach, and now I'm writing the conclusion of what Jesus did and taught, and it's what Jesus does and, taught, te does and, taught, does and teaches through the apostles by the Spirit. Um, so it's clear that uh, Luke comes before um, Acts, therefore it has to be written sometime before 62. Um, and Wenham um, puts it in the, in the 50s, the mid-50s as I remember. I don't have a specific date here. And he also uh, bases partly on the argument uh, 
that Paul refers to Luke and to Luke's gospel in 2 Corinthians. And he's trying to link up the gospel of Luke with, uh, Paul's, uh, with Paul's letters. So this is 2 Corinthians 8, where Paul writes, Thanks be to God who puts the same earnestness on your behalf in the heart of Titus. For he not only accepted our appeal, but being himself very earnest, he has gone to you of his own accord. And we have sent along with him the brother whose fame in the gospel has spread through all the churches. And not only this, but he has been appointed by the churches to travel with us in this gracious work. So Titus is going along, and along uh, T- Titus is being sent um, to the Corinthians, and along with him is a brother uh, who is well-known in the gospel, well-known through all the churches. And uh, Wenham wonders who that is, who is this brother. Uh, he's obviously associated with Paul, uh, he could be a brother who's famous for his preaching of the gospel. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the word gospel can also mean gospel book, when it argues even by this early date when 2 Corinthians is being composed. And so he argues that this is Luke, and he's famous and well-known throughout the churches for composing the gospel book uh, that we know is the gospel of Luke. Uh, we know that Luke and Paul were associated with each other, and uh, Wenham has a, a fairly detailed argument for saying that this fits with where Paul is when he's writing Second Corinthians and the, the setting of that uh, of that uh, the, the setting of his life story. So, if that's the case, then Second Corinthians is written at a time when uh, Luke had not only finished his gospel, but when the gospel had begun to had been circulated sufficiently so that he had become well known throughout the churches for his work in the gospel. And so you can date, move from a date, 2 Corinthians, uh, uh, all, of, all dating in the New Testament is relative um, to uh, um, what we can reconstruct from other parts of the New Testament. Uh, but uh, Wenham ends up saying that 2 Corinthians is somewhere in the, maybe the late 50s. Uh, Luke has written his book in the early to mid 50s. And then he thinks uh, back from that to Mark, suggests that Mark is written in the mid-40s, and then Matthew is the first of the Gospels written around 40. So that puts uh, Matthew, you know, three or four decades earlier than most people would say uh, today. Uh, I, still think that's, I, th- I still think that's too late. Uh, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't make any sense to me that uh, there would be any delay in composing an account of the Messiah. Uh, that's what, what, what Jews do when they when something big happens, they compose a, uh, an account of it. They have a literate writing, at least, one, at least a class that's literate, a writing class. Uh, and now they think that the climax of their entire history has come. The climax has come uh, to the promises to Abraham. Everything that they've been hoping for for millennia has now happened, and they wait a decade to jot it down. That, just is, that doesn't make sense on the face of it. And... Um, the, uh, I don't know if this comes from, uh, Richard Balcom has a book called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, which is an argument f- partly from uh, studies of eyewitness testimony in, uh, among social scientists, um, arguing that the, the uh, Gospels, the synoptics particularly, have show the marks of uh, being composed by eyewitnesses. There are certain, certain ways of describing things that he think, thinks uh, point to that. So if you have, and, and that's the tradition that Matthew was an eyewitness of the things he's recounting, if that's the case, if Matthew is, as he's traditionally thought to be a tax collector, he's literate and numerate, he's capable of sitting and listening to Jesus and jotting down notes, uh, when and provides some evidence that um, this was a, and maybe Balcom does too, I can't remember, but uh, the evidence that this was a, note-taking was something that was popular among disciples of different rabbis. Jew- Jewish rabbis had uh, students who would take, take down notes and record the lectures and then circulate the lectures. And those later get uh, uh, collected into various Jewish collections. Uh, why not Matthew? Matthew's capable of it from what we know of Matthew. Uh, he could be jotting down notes and composing basically the Sermon on the Mount and the Olivet Discourse um, before Jesus goes to the cross. Parts, parts, of, the, parts of Matthew's gospel might have been uh, in written written in some form already before uh, Jesus even died, and then you know again why wait a decade until you compose it and circulate it? It seems so. Forty is forty is very early by most standards. I don't see any reason why it wouldn't come uh, 
you know, Matthew, uh, if Matthew wrote the gospel and Matthew is who he is traditionally believed to be, then there's no reason why it uh, would, uh, there would be any, any delay at all. It would, you know, the gospel of Matthew would be out and circulating among the churches within, um, within a few years after Jesus' resurrection. Uh, Paul's comment to, Peter, uh, to Timothy about his knowledge of the scripture from an early age uh, it's usually said to be, this is, uh, this is obviously talking about the Old Testament. Well, uh, I'm not sure that is so obvious. If, if we, uh, the, the things that um, uh, Paul attributes, what, what, the things that Paul says P, uh, Timothy learned from the scriptures seem to be referring not just to the Old Testament, but to the New. So there are hints in the New Testament that accounts of Jesus were already uh, uh, in, at, uh, circulating around the churches um, and that uh, they were considered authoritative scripture. Okay, so all of that uh, to say that, that, that eliminates the, any synoptic problem. If you push everything early, you say that these are eyewitnesses or based on eyewitnesses, if they're dependent, mutually dependent on each other, you have this accumulating tradition of gospel writing, uh, then the synoptic problem just kind of disappears and uh, there's, no, uh, there's no need for uh, Q to fill the gap. Um, the, uh, the, the, issue, the, the issue here, the pastoral issue, I guess, um, that's at stake here is, has to do with the reliability of the, uh, of the gospel accounts. So uh, if, if you have a gap of several decades between the events and the recording of those events, then it raises questions about how accurately people remembered, how accurate the sources are. These things were uh, circulating in uh, oral form, according to many, uh, many of the uh, uh, reconstructions, circulating oral form for many years before they get recorded and uh, before they get uh, into a fixed uh, form. And uh, that just raises questions about the reliability and authority of the gospel. So I think that's, the, that's why you would need to know this in a kind of pastoral setting. You need to be able to defend the reliability of the gospels. And it seems to me the one aspect of that, not the only thing, but the one aspect of that is to show that they are uh, records from eyewitnesses. Uh, they were they're people who were actually there at the events and that they were recorded early and, and attained a fixed form very early in the church's history.